All right, everybody, welcome to New Grad Ed Day. Uh, my name is Kyle Sorensen, and just to give you guys a little background on myself, I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I've been teaching uh, anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology at just different places around Denver for the last 10 years or so. I've uh, taught at Arapaho Community College, Red Rocks Community College, um, Skag School of Pharmacy at Antrieff Medical Campus, as well as the uh, Platt College of Nursing. So uh, today, basically, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a refresher on the structure function of the brain, and then really delve into acute disorders of brain function would be sort of our main topic for today. So uh, just as far as an outline of today's lecture, what we'll be doing is going over just a general overview of brain structure function. We'll get into some of the pathophysiology for the mechanisms of brain injury, and then we'll talk about some selected pathologies like ICP or intracranial pressure. We'll get into reflex tests. Uh, we'll talk about traumatic brain injury, stroke, aneurysm, and diff, you know infection of the brain. So starting out with a review of just brain anatomy. Uh, it may, may be a while since you guys have thought about this or seen it, but <clears throat> if you guys look here, we see here the, the brain is this sort of highly folded structure. And the reason why it has so many folds is that it helps us allow you know to, to fit more brain matter within the skull. You know, the skull is sort of a limited space. And by having these folds, you can increase the surface area to have more brain matter to fit, if that makes sense. Now, um, if just in, in terms of general characteristics of the brain, it's only about three pounds. But three pounds is still heavy enough to where if the brain didn't float within the skull, it would effectively crush under its own weight. So if you can imagine that the undersides of the brain here, um, if they didn't float within the skull, these would sit on the skull itself and uh, the bones of the skull, and this would all get crushed and bruised. So what we need then is the brain to float within the cranium, and we'll talk about how that works later. Now we can divide the brain into different lobes. So this is all the cerebrum, which contains your frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, occipital lobe. And uh, we also have our brain stem, which has your midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum back here. And we'll get to some more of the, the functions of these parts later. So looking at the underside of the brain here, you can see the temporal lobes would be on the side. We have the frontal lobes up here. Uh, we have to talk about our brain stem. That has your midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, as well as the cerebellum back here. Now probably one of the more important points from this slide is the fact that all of these cranial nerves, which you can see are in yellow, uh, there's 12 pairs of them. So you can kind of count your way through. It would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. But there's 12 pairs of them. Um, 10 of the 12 pairs. So these ones right here basically emerge from the brainstem. So uh, not the olfactory, not the optic, but all of the rest of your cranial nerves here emerge from the brainstem. So when we talk about cranial nerve tests later and talking about assessing Glasgow's coma scale, getting a sense of the extent of brain injury um, can really be inferred by how well these cranial nerves are functioning. Because if, if you have a lot of cranial nerve function, then that at least tells you that your brain stem is working correctly. And that contains a lot of vital centers for survival. So it gets you a sense of the um, extent of injury and the urgency of that injury as well. Now, um, this is an anterior and posterior view of the brain. But what we're looking at here is basically a mid-sagittal cut through the brain itself. Remember, we talked about the frontal lobe, occipital, parietal lobe, temporal lobe here. Uh, but really what we want to highlight in this structure, this view rather, is the corpus callosum, which helps connect the two cerebral hemispheres. We have the diencephalon, which contains your thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. And then your brainstem here, which contains your midbrain, pons, and your medulla oblongata. Now the cerebellum is also visible back here. Uh, it only accommodates, you know, maybe a fraction of your total brain matter. But what's interesting is it contains about 30% of all of the brain cells. So uh, it plays a really big role in uh, coordination of balance. So uh, we can see that the brain is this highly interconnected, highly complex structure. Um, if you were just going to look at the brain as far as you know, touching it and feeling it, dissecting it, what it would sort of look like is this gray mass of nothing too exciting. You know, It just would look like this kind of lump of soft tissue. Now, um, I would say that it has about the consistency of like a ripe avocado, so it's very, very soft. But when you assess the structure of the brain at a microscopic level, what we see is that it's actually a really, really complex organ. 
And it's actually probably one of the more complex things known to humans. And with this type of image, what we're looking at is a type of MRI called a diffuse tensor image. And it basically highlights all the white matter tracks or fiber tracks that connect the brain. You can see it's this highly interconnected structure. So knowing that the brain is soft, delicate, and highly interconnected, what we need to talk about then is basically how the brain is protected. So we know that it's protected by our skull. You know, when you talk about the functions of bones, most, you know, going back to anatomy, you'd say, oh, you know, the bones of your cranium have a structure which is hard, which helps protect your brain. But what we also want to talk about is uh, the meninges. So you guys remember the meninges. We have our dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and your pia mater. Now, the dura mater is this tougher layer of tissue that connects the brain to the skull itself. Now, there are areas where the dura mater can separate into two, and that's going to form what's called the dural venous sinus. Dural venous sinus contains all of the blood that drains out of your brain, and these eventually all converge to form the jugular veins, which then drain it back into your heart. Um, below the dura mater, we have your uh, arachnoid mater. Arachnoid mater has the arachnoid granulations, which basically are protrusions that go up through the dura mater into the dural venous sinus, and they're places where you can drain CSF back into the bloodstream. We have your subarachnoid space, which is basically a space between the arachnoid mater and your pia mater. The subarachnoid space is a fluid-filled space. It's filled with cerebrospinal fluid, a.k.a. brain Gatorade. Um, the reason why I call it brain Gatorade is it's made of a fluid that's made of basically water, sugar, and electrolytes, just like Gatorade, except for this cerebrospinal fluid is basically filtered from your blood, and we'll talk about how that works later. Now, the innermost layer of the meninges is called the pia mater, which literally translates to soft mother. Now, the pia mater is made of this loose type of connective tissue that has a lot of blood vessels within it. And I think that's why this is shown as being pink. And the blood vessels that are within the pia mater also help to nourish the outside of the brain. Now, as far as the types of brain matter, you guys remember we have gray matter, white matter. Um, gray matter of the brain is made of neuron cell bodies, or brain cell, cell bodies. And then all this white matter is basically made of well, the reason why it's white is fatty tissue because it's made of myelinated axons and myelin's made of basically fat wrappings which act as insulation and that's kind of give it kind of a whiter appearance. So you have cells, the projections of those cells. So if we go back to the slide, you can see here where the cells would be on the cortex or the outermost parts of the brain and then the projections of those cells which would be the white matter fiber tracks that basically just lead to all these different brain connections. So <clears throat> when we talk about support of the brain, we could talk about the dural septa. Dural septa are basically areas where the dura mater can dive down deep within the different fissures of the brain and kind of help secure the brain in position so that when you wiggle your head around, the brain's not sloshing around on the inside of your skull, and it's held in position by these dural septa. Now, if you guys remember, we talked about how there's the dural venous sinuses. So here we have the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, and they all come together to form this confluence of sinuses. Now, what, the reason why it's blue is that this is a blood-filled space. So all the veins of your brain basically drain into these dural venous sinuses, and that venous blood all comes together right around the confluence. It eventually uh, goes down and then exits the skull through the jugular foramen to the occipital sinus, and then turns into your internal jugular veins, which then drain blood back towards your heart. So... Later, we'll talk about intracranial pressure and different ways that it can, you know, you can get rises in pressure within the skull. But one of those is basically heart failure. Because if the heart's failing to pump blood along and it's backing up into your veins, um, that can back up into the veins of your meninges and that can lead to rises in pressure within the skull itself. So um, we said earlier that the brain weighs about three pounds and it's like a soft avocado. So that means it could potentially crush under its own weight. But what we do know is that the brain doesn't crush under its own weight <laughs> under normal circumstances. And it's actually supported and uh, protected by um, that cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the outside of the brain. Well, we said that cerebrospinal fluid is basically filtered blood. It's a lot like blood plasma, except it doesn't have a lot of protein. It's mostly water, sugar, electrolytes. The sugar is glucose. So... Uh, what we find is that that CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid, it's made within these large fluid-filled spaces deep within the brain called the ventricles. Kind of like the ventricles of your heart, except for this is filled with CSF. 
So each of these ventricles would contain a structure called choroid plexus, which makes CSF and basically fills these spaces with that fluid. So you have these large fluid-filled spaces deep within the brain. And what these effectively do is they make the brain less dense. And by being less dense, it's actually more buoyant, so therefore it can float within the skull and not crush under its own weight. So that's pretty good. <laughs> and so um, these, basic, these ventricles are basically allowed, or they play a role in buoyancy. But you can trace their origin all the way back to embryonic development, which is pretty cool. Now you might wonder, how the heck does fluid that's made from spaces deep within the brain end up on the outside of the brain? Well, it all starts here from choroid plexus. So choroid plexus is this kind of vascular network uh, you find lining the spaces within all your ventricles. So your lateral ventricles, your third and your fourth ventricle, all this kind of red stuff. And there's a special type of cell that lines these capillaries called the ependymal cell. It's a type of glia. And these ependymal cells are capable of basically taking your blood plasma and converting the components of that plasma into CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. So it makes that water sugar electrolyte mix. Now that's going to fill the spaces like your lateral ventricle. From your lateral ventricle that fluid's going to flow into your third. From the third ventricle it's going to flow into the fourth down here via the cerebral aqueduct. And then then you might wonder okay well how does fluid in your brain get out? Well there are these tiny little holes called the apertures. So there's the lateral and median apertures and these are basically like holes in your brain that uh, connect to the ventricular system so that CSF made in the ventricles can leak out of these holes out of the outside of your brain which is kind of weird and then enter a space here called the subarachnoid space between your arachnoid and pia and basically surround the outside of your brain so it forms a nice fluid cushion so one thing that's important to note and you maybe have noticed here notice how the surface of your brain is not touching your skull same with over here surface of your brain not touching the skull. That's because your brain's floating within the skull. And it can float in part because it's surrounded by this fluid cushion and also made buoyant by the ventricular system. So the effective weight of your brain is almost zero. Like if you could put a tiny little scale here and, and try to measure the weight of your brain, it's like trying to jump on a scale instead of a swimming pool. It's going to be basically your weight's going to show like zero because this thing's totally floating, which is great. You know, helps protect the soft structure that, you know, is so important to us. Now then you might wonder, okay, well, if this fluid's being made by your choroid plexus and you're making several hundred milliliters of this CSF a day, where's it going? Like, where's it draining? Because you don't want it to accumulate within the inside of your skull. Well, effectively, what ends up happening is that CSF eventually drains in the subarachnoid space and then it goes up and then enters these little tiny protrusions, which you can see here. All of these protrusions are areas where subarachnoid tissue pushes up between the dura mater into the dural venous sinus. And that's what we call the arachnoid granulation or arachnoid villi. Now what these are are areas where CSF gets reabsorbed back into your bloodstream. So remember we talked about how your dural venous sinus contains venous blood? Well, CSF gets reabsorbed back into venous blood and then all these dural venous sinuses eventually converge and then drain out of your skull through the jugular veins. So that's pretty cool. So one thing we'll talk about later is hydrocephalus, which is basically water on the brain. And um, that can result from maybe a blockage of these little arachnoid granulations where if you can't drain CSF properly, fluid just builds up within the skull and that leads to rises in pressure, which can lead, be life-threatening. So one important system that I like to mention, probably because it's new and really cool, is called the glymphatic system. And if you thought, well, it sounds like a lymphatic system, that's because it's exactly what it is. So it's called the glymphatic system because it's basically a, a type of lymphatic system made from glial cells. And this was previously unknown. Like maybe you guys learned that there are no lymph vessels in the brain, spinal cord. But it turns out, oh, just kidding. We, did, we thought there weren't, but there are. <laughs> so the glymphatic system are basically lymph vessels that help drain CSF, or not CSF, but also uh, excess fluid in the brain into these little vessels. And these vessels have one-way valves that prevent backflow. And that helps take excess fluid out of the brain as well. Now, we don't fully understand how this functions yet or even how it's completely structured. We just do know it's present and we do know that it connects to um, the rest of your bloodstream. So um, what that means is, is that uh, the, the brain does have a lymphatic system. 
It helps with washing and cleansing of the brain tissue. And uh, one uh, disease that the lymphatic system is implicated in is Al Alzheimer's disease. So if you guys remember Alzheimer's disease, we have an accumulation of uh, malformed proteins within the brain called beta amyloid plaques. And these beta amyloid plaques, um, if they accumulate within brain tissue, it leads to oxidative stress that can, that can damage brain tissue and it can lead to cognitive decline as a result. Now, uh, if, the, if this lymphatic system is functioning properly, uh, what we can see then is that those plaques can leave the brain tissue, uh, basically, uh, you know, go with the flow with your lymphatic system, and then just get washed out of your brain. And that's going to keep it clear of those plaques and maybe help prevent Alzheimer's disease. So um, it'll be interesting to learn more about uh, how this newly discovered system plays a role in uh, already known diseases. So going back and talking about the cerebral hemispheres, remember how we talked about how there was right and left cerebral hemispheres? They're separated by a longitudinal fissure, which would contain dura mater going down between them. And if you're looking at the real brain, you know, it's this looks like this kind of lump of folds. Well, those folds are called gyri, and each gyrus contains some sort of vital function, either for consciousness, learning behavior, memory, you know, uh, perception of different sensory systems. So, so a lot of really important functions are, of your brain are located in these gyri, which are basically aggregations of gray matter in these folds. Now, um, what we can also look at, and it's kind of better to assess here with the color-coded part of the brain, is the brain can also be divided in lobes. So we have a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. And each of these lobes contains gyri that have specific functions. So if you were to look at a, uh, another view of the cerebral hemisphere, we would see then it's even more color-coded and nicely sort of laid out for us. So going back and talking about the frontal lobe, you guys maybe remember how it has the prefrontal cortex, which is, plays a big role in um, you know, personality, morality, judgment, behavior. It plays a big role in really who you are as an individual. So if this part of your frontal lobe gets damaged, you're going to see big deficits in personality, and morality, judgment, behavior. Um, the frontal lobe also has some pretty important motor structures. So it's got the premotor cortex, which is for planning of motor movements. It has your primary motor cortex, which contains the uh, pyramidal neurons that send motor output to the muscles of your body. It also contains your motor speech area, so for speech production, which I'm using a lot of that right now. My left cerebral hemisphere contains the motor speech area called the Broca's area. So if you guys ever heard of Broca's aphasia, this is where the Broca motor speech area gets damaged and individuals have difficulty producing speech. They'll still be able to understand speech because that's the Wernicke's area, but they have difficulty producing speech because this has the neurons that control the muscles for speech production or vocalization. Now, if you guys look back here in the parietal lobe, we see it has you know the primary somatosensory cortex. Well, somato means body, so if it's the somatosensory cortex, it's for body sensations. So if you're feeling things from your body, like touch, temperature, pressure, vibration, pain, that's going to be the primary somatosensory cortex. And each of these parts of the cortex correlates with a specific body part. And the same goes for the primary motor cortex. Each of these parts of the primary motor cortex correlate with a specific body part. So if someone has a stroke that affects, you know, so maybe somewhere like just right here, that means they're going to lose both motor and sensory functions of specific brain areas. Well, since the face occupies a really large portion of the gray matter here in both of these cortices, this is why we see that stroke often affects the face. Because if the face is such a sensitive area and it, and it accounts for a large portion of the motor and sensory areas here, if someone has a stroke, there's a really high probability that they're going to end up with some sort of facial, you know, sort of presentation of that. That's not to say that all strokes lead to facial presentation, because some might not just depending on the location of that stroke. Now, it also has, the parietal lobe also has your primary somatosensory association area. Um, and the somatosensory association area helps you to sort of put more complex feelings together. So let's say if your eyes were closed and you're just like touching an object with your hands and you can feel that that object feels like a phone, well, since you can't touch every part of the phone at the same time, it's your somatosensory association area that puts that, sort of more complex association together and lets you understand that you're touching a phone.
right? Instead of just touching this maybe cold thing that feels metallic, right? So the part of the parietal lobe also has your Wernicke's area. And if you were to pronounce this in the German form, it'd be the Wernicke's area. But the Wernicke's area is your speech recognition center. So it's very important. You guys are using, using that right now to hear the words that I'm speaking. <laughs> so your Wernicke's area is located again on your left cerebral hemisphere and it kind of spans the space between your parietal and temporal lobes. So if your Wernicke's area gets damaged, then people end up with Wernicke's aphasia, which is the inability to understand um, spoken language. So what's interesting is if they have a stroke in the Wernicke's area, but their Broca's area is still intact, that means they'll be able to produce words, but not understand the words that they're saying, which is interesting. Now the occipital lobe back here contains a lot of visual functions, right? So when you think about like your visual cortex for, you know, um, just basically seeing something, you know, that's going to be your occipital lobe. So uh, a lot of, a lot of brain matter, a lot of brain function is devoted towards vision and arguably are one of our more important senses. But if you were to look at, you know, the amount of brain matter dedicated to vision, uh, it definitely outcompetes every other sense. So we're a very visual species, so to speak. Um, and I'll let you guys kind of think about what you might think the visual association area is if the somatosensory association area helped us kind of put more complex feelings together the visual association area would help us put more complex images together like recognition of faces and that kind of stuff so uh, the temporal lobe also very important contains a lot of auditory structures. So you guys are using this right now because it, you know, in part cont it contains Wernicke's area for speech recognition, but it all starts with your primary auditory cortex, which basically contains the cell bodies of neurons that receive inputs from your cochleas, which you use to hear things. And um, that's going to involve your temporal lobes. Now, uh, the temporal lobe also has your olfactory cortex for smell. And then there's another lobe kind of tucked away in here. It doesn't get a lot of credit, sort of hidden. It's like the shy of that's the shy one of the lobes, but that's your insula, and it's basically located between your frontal lobe and your temporal lobe in this lateral sulcus, and we call it the um, insular lobe because it's sort of in there, <laughs> and it contains your primary gustatory cortex for taste, as well as your um, uh, primary um, vestibular cortex for balance, like your sense of balance and your head's position in space. Now, earlier we talked about how the diencephalon, which was deep, deep, deep within the cerebellum, I'm sorry, the cerebrum, um, contains your thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus. Well, the thalamus is a really important brain structure. <clears throat> um, it receives all of the sensory information, or pretty much all the sen sensory information that your brain's receiving. So when you think of like vision, taste, hearing, balance, bodily sensations, all that goes through the thalamus first. So we think about the thalamus as being like the gatekeeper of your brain, right? And what's interesting is it actually helps filter out and sort this information in meaningful ways. So uh, the thalamus actually helps filter out 90% of that sensory information. So that means that only 10% of information that, that's getting sent to your brain is actually making it to those sensory areas we talked about, right? So, you know, you might have, you might be, you might, your eyes might be picking up a lot of visual information, but you're only really seeing a small fraction of that at any moment in time because the thalamus works in conjunction with other parts of your brain for, you know, uh, attentional processes to really filter out and kind of hone in on what's important to be conscious of in that moment. So when you think about like, um, you know, sedatives where people get, you know, knocked out in their sleep, um, those are going to help really act on the thalamus by shutting it down. And if you can shut down the thalamus, then people are no longer aware of the sensory information that's being sent to their brain and they're unconscious as a result. But that also means if their thalamus is damaged, they're going to remain unconscious because they're not able to receive any other sensory inputs. So their, their brain is essentially separated from all of the receptors of their body, except for smell. Smell is the only sense that bypasses the thalamus. So this is one of the reasons why you can wake people up with an odor. You guys ever seen that where you can kind of crack one of those little vials open and put a smell under someone's nose um, and that can wake them up because even if the thalamus is asleep, um, that can bypass it and you know sort of help bring them to consciousness. <laughs> now, uh, 
Below the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus. Hypo literally means below, so hypothalamus, below the thalamus, contains a lot of vital functions. So when you think about like thirst, um, your sleep-wake cycles, body temperature regulation, control of hormones, that's the hypothalamus. And it also attaches to your pituitary gland, which is the master control gland of your endocrine system, and that's under the control of your hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus plays a role in the link between your, your brain and your endocrine system of hormones. <clears throat> Back here we have the epithalamus, which contains kind of the more important thing to talk about is the pineal gland. And that pineal gland is this little structure here, um, releases a hormone called melatonin, and that plays a role in the circadian rhythm, which is sleep-wake cycles. So the last but not least, we have the brainstem. And if you guys remember, the brainstem is, as it sounds, like the stem of the brain right here. And the brainstem is made of three important parts. We have our midbrain, pons, and the medulla oblongata, right? Now in this picture, the diencephalon is also shown. And I think that's just to show that it's kind of intimately connected with the brainstem. But technically, the diencephalon is not part of the brainstem. Remember, the diencephalon contains your thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus. Whereas the brainstem only contains your midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. And if you guys remember, all these little yellow things coming off of here are the cranial nerves. And if you remember earlier, how many of the cranial nerves emerge from the brainstem? And if you answered 10, you're right. It's 10 of the 12 cranial nerves come off your brainstem. This is why cranial nerve reflex tests are so important in terms of assessing brainstem function. Now the midbrain plays a role, it's kind of varied, um, it has these structures here called the cerebral peduncle, which literally translates to little foot, and the cerebral peduncles contain basically motor and sensory tracts that carry information up and down your brain. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reflex centers too. Now uh, the pons, which is this sort of center part here, um, is a large bulbous region, also contains motor sensory tracts. But the pons also contains nuclei, or little centers of, of neuron cell bodies, that help regulate breathing rhythm. So when you think about like your unconscious rhythm of ventilation, um, it's the pons that regulates that. So we can all be thankful we don't have to, to think about breathing at all moments in time. So because we have a pons that does it for us. Now the medulla oblongata down here, it also contains nuclei for breathing, since it's such an important thing. There's some redundancy or backup. But the medulla oblongata also contains the cardiovascular centers of your brain. So when you think about like vasomotor tone, you know, regulating the diameter of your blood vessels, that's your medulla oblongata that helps regulate that to keep to maintain adequate blood pressure. Uh, the medulla oblongata also contains cardiac centers to maintain adequate heart rate. So when you think about like normal resting heart rate, um, that's going to be mediated in part through the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata also contains a lot of reflex centers. So when you think about like vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, sneezing, coughing, medulla oblongata contains the nuclei for the reflexes listed prior. Now, um, in another view of the brainstem, we can see, again, the diencephalon, so thalamus. Remember, sensory relay. Uh, hypothalamus isn't very clearly shown here, but going back and talking about the brainstem, you can see your um, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. So we said the midbrain has the cerebral peduncles, which were for motor sensory relay, but it also has this structure here, kind of weird looking thing, it's called the corpora quadrigemina, which literally translates to the body of four twins. So you have your superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi, so one, two, three, four bumps. So the superior colliculi are these two superior most bumps, which are basically collections of neuron cell bodies that play a role in visual reflex. You can see your optic tract is intimately close by as well. So that, um, it, let's say if, if um, you reflexively flinch or duck your head because, um, you know, some visual stimulus like a ball coming at your face or something, right? Or a bird flying by. Um, <laughs> the superior colliculi basically help with that visual reflex. So before you can even really be conscious of this thing that's happening and your body just sort of undergoes this unconscious reaction to it, um, the superior colliculi would be the things that mediate that in a visual sense. The inferior colliculi are, are basically parts of your brain that play a role in auditory reflex. 
So if you're if you're if you hear a stimulus like a loud noise or a crash or a bang or something, and you reflexively flinch or duck to avoid that noise, uh, it's the inferior colliculi that also play a role there. And again, that's part of your midbrain, which is part of your brainstem, and that. Uh, is something that we can assess as far as like, you know, your reflex tests, which we'll talk about later. The pons, we said, played a big role in ventilation or breathing. Has part of your fourth ventricle back here. And then the medulla oblongata contains lots of different nuclei here. Um, some that are important in breathing, others that are important in cardiovascular centers, as well as uh, reflexes. So taken together as a whole, we can see that the brain stem in itself um, it's pretty dang important. I mean, if you want to breathe without having to think about it, or if you want to control your blood pressure at all, um, you're going to need a brainstem. So this is why we talk about the brainstem as being like the vital centers of your body. And um, all of these, I'm kind of alluding to these things that we'll talk about later when we get into the selected pathophysiological mechanisms as far as, uh, you know, um, acute disorders of brain function. Okay, now moving on to uh, mechanisms of brain injury. Uh, what we can do is differentiate brain injury into two main types, or kind of two sequential events. We have primary and secondary brain injury. Um, primary brain injury would be defined as sort of the initial insult. So if someone had a stroke, like a you know, let's say an, a hemorrhagic stroke, that would be the primary insult, which would essentially be loss of blood flow to a particular brain region. And then secondary injury would basically be the damage that results from the body's physiological response to the initial insult. And um, what this essentially means is that sometimes the, the way that the body handles injury in and itself can cause more damage, you know, from like inflammatory processes, a buildup of free radicals, and so on. So uh, what we can kind of deduce from this is... Uh, between primary and secondary injury, uh, whether each one is more prominent, the most critical factor in determining the cell fate of brain cells or neurons is basically the amount of ATP that's left. Since ATP we think about as being like the cellular currency, and the majority of which comes from oxidative respiration or phosphorylation you know, in mitochondria of your brain, uh, which requires oxygen, uh, the amount of ATP that your cells have uh, after the initial insult or even throughout the progression of the secondary injury uh, will really help determine the extent of, of the total amount of injury that, that could result, like whether those cells die or are just temporarily injured. So uh, there's two mechanisms that can cause brain cell death, uh, one of which is anaerobic metabolism, which we'll kind of get into the mechanism of that as well as a deterioration of ion gradients. So if you guys remember, uh, across a typical, any typical cell, you have a concentration gradient of sodium, potassium, chloride, and so on. Now, if you have a deterioration of those gradients, what can happen is you can get electrolyte imbalance, but you can also get uh, water imbalance, since water follows electrolytes through osmosis. Um, cells that don't have enough ATP end up accumulating too much intracellular sodium and that causes swelling of those cells and potentially even cell lysis, which means they explode, and that's it. That Once that happens, they're, they're gone. So as far as like the sequence of, of brain injury, let's just start with ischemia. So ischemia just means loss of blood flow. And um, we can this ischemia could be due to, let's say, like hemorrhagic stroke. It could be from like cardiovascular shock. It could be from a wide variety of different things. But, um, you know... Regardless of that, when you do have ischemia, the first thing that's going to happen is your cells will become hypoxic. So remember, ischemia means a lack of blood flow, but hypoxia means low oxygen levels. Since cells are continually using oxygen, uh, if there's if your blood's not sort of you know flowing and replenishing oxygen supplies within a local area of tissue, that local area of tissue and cells will become hypoxic. You know, from low O2. Now, when O2 levels are low, your mitochondria can't continually to f continue to function properly since they need oxygen as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain to make ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Without O2, mitochondria stop producing as much ATP. If you can't produce as much ATP, that means you can't um, get rid of calcium from the cytosol. 
So calcium is an important intracellular signaling molecule, it's actually an atom, but uh, it's also used in a variety of diff different processes as well. But when ATP levels get low, since you need ATP to move calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum or outside of the cell, cells end up with what's called calcium overload. And one of the results of calcium overload is essentially the production of free radicals. So if you guys remember, free radicals are atoms or molecules that have a unpaired electron, and that can make and break different bonds indiscriminately throughout your cell, which is not good because that just leads to degradation of cell processes and can ultimately lead to cell death. So if we kind of back our way up again, yes, we talked about how lack of O2 leads to less ATP production and so on. But lack of O2 also um, basically prevents mitochondria from sequestering calcium. So again, calcium overload. So you have two different pathways, one where there's low ATP, one from mitochondria not holding on to calcium properly because of degradation of the mitochondrial membrane. This leads to calcium overload within the inside of the cell, and again, free radical production. But if we back our way up again, this is probably one of the more interesting pathways, is that ischemia itself can lead to the excess release of a neurotransmitter called glutamate. And glutamate can be released, uh, first of all, it's a neurotransmitter from a wide variety of cells in your body. Uh, glutamate is one of those neurotransmitters that excites other neurons and cells. So when a glutamate's being released, it basically excites the cell that's receiving that, that signal. Now, glutamate release can result from injury of the tissue where the cells burst open and they release excess glutamate. And that excess glutamate from the, that normally is on the inside of those cells, once it gets released and it's loose in the tissue, uh, then it's being, you know, it's abnormally present. And when glutamate's present, it causes the opening of a type of channel called an NMDA channel. And it's a type of neurotransmitter receptor you find in the brain. So this spilling of glutamate opens up NMDA channels, which again, causes calcium to enter the cell, leading to more calcium overload, free radical production, and death. Remember, free radicals are not good because they have an unpaired electron, it can start breaking bonds indiscriminately, leading to degradation of all cell processes and ultimately cell death. So we can talk about how ischemia has multiple pathways for cell free radical production and cell death. Another interesting phenomenon too is that let's say if someone has ischemia and then they have um, you know sort of a, a decline in sort of tissue function but what happens is that once blood flow is restored and we get reperfusion, let's say the, um, you know, the cardiovascular collapse is you know, fixed, it's reversed, and blood starts flowing again through their brain, or the, um, you know, the stroke sort of dissolves and, again, you get blood flow back to the brain. We call this reperfusion. What happens in this case is that in the, in the instance of reperfusion in an already injured tissue, by reintroducing oxygen too quickly, you get the production of oxygen free radicals, and those free radicals themselves can cause cell death and damage. So, reperfusion injury occurs when you actually have a restoration of blood flow that occurs too quickly. So, what ends up happening is you get more free radicals and again, cell death. Uh, what can also happen is that through reperfusion, you can <clears throat> bring in new immune cells. Those immune cells can also lead to the release of free radicals that can also lead to cell death. So it's kind of odd to think that um, mechanisms that you would normally think about sort of helping with the process end up leading to cell death. And so reperfusion would be an example of secondary cell, so secondary brain injury, if that makes sense. Whereas ischemia would be an example of primary brain injury. Now, um, one selected pathophysiological concept we'll talk about today is uh, intracranial pressure, right, or uh, ICP. So increased intracranial pressure occurs through a variety of mechanisms, but um, there's three sort of main elements that occupy your cranium of your, you know, inside your skull, and that includes your brain tissue, cerebrospinal fluid, and blood. Now between these three things they're each going to contribute to the total amount of pressure that you find within your skull. 
And so we talk about your cranial pressure, intracranial pressure as being basically normally between zero and 15 millimeters of mercury. Zero millimeters of mercury means that it's the same as atmospheric pressure. 15 millimeters of mercury is just slightly above atmospheric pressure. Um, and you can compare this with like systolic blood pressure, which is like 120. So basically, normally, there's almost no extra pressure within your skull. So increased intracranial pressure can occur when there's like space occupying lesions, which can, you know, basically, um, you know, add more volume to the, in the space inside your skull and increase pressure as a result. It may, came, it may come from edema, which can be vasogenic or cytotoxic. And that edema or basically swelling due to extra fluid can, again, increase pressure within the skull. Or it could come from obstruction or excessive production of cerebrospinal fluid. And again, it would increase the volume of, of fluid within your skull and again, increase more pressure. And so increased intracranial pressure can be life-threatening. And um, one of the conditions that can result from intracranial pressure rises is a disorder called hydrocephalus. Hydro means water, cephalus means head. So hydrocephalus means water head, right? So basically what this is, is an abnormal accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. We talked about how normally CSF is made by um, the ventricular system of your brain, and it's drained within, uh, back into your dural venous sinuses of your blood. And as a result of this sort of production and drainage, normally CSF pressure is maybe slightly above zero, you know, maybe potentially an average of 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, there's lots of things that can cause hydrocephalus. One of the more common ones is a congenital neural tube defect, or NTD. So neural tube defects occur as a result of abnormal fetal development, or abnormal embryology, which could be genetic, could be teratogenic, or that could be from exposure to chemicals and toxins, maybe even viruses. So um, what happens is the neural tube is an infolding of the embryological membrane that forms this fluid-filled space that eventually becomes the ventricular system we saw about earlier. Now, if you have a neural tube defect, usually what happens is the aqueduct of sylvis, or the cerebral aqueduct that connects your third and fourth ventricles, is blocked. Whereas that should normally be connected. It just doesn't connect as it should, or it's very narrow. And as a result, there's a, there's a backup of fluid within the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle of your brain and that can lead to hydrocephalus. So this is because of an increased volume of CSF. Now, this causes a trait of symptoms. Uh, you see that there's gait instability because of swelling and uh, impingement on your cerebellum. There's uh, urinary incontinence because of impingement on your hypothalamus, which plays a role in regulation of your urinary system, as well as uh, you know symptoms of what we would describe as something like dementia. Now, it's not age-related dementia, but dementia in the sense that there's a cognitive decline. And again, that's because of extra pressure being placed on the um, cortical areas of the cerebrum. Now, obstructive hydrocephalus is basically due to some sort of obstruction, and that obstructs the flow of CSF. Now, it could be from like a blocked aqueduct of sylvis, as you'd see with like a neural tube defect, but obstructive hydrocephalus could also be due to a blockage of the arachnoid granulations because of, let's say, like a subarachnoid um, hemorrhage, or SAH, which can actually um, introduce red blood cells that block that, that, uh, that uh, arachnoid granulation and prevent CSF from being reabsorbed. And so this is kind of a more extreme example of hydrocephalus. Um, fortunately, in, in, the, in this case of this young girl from Indo India, they were able to, to repair the hydrocephalus. You can see there's such a dramatic swelling of the cranium here because the bones of this newborn are still soft. There's, you know, the fontanelles haven't, haven't closed completely, as you can see here with the frontal fontanelle, widely present. Um, and luckily, in this case, the cranium can kind of accommodate that extra pressure and swell as a, in a, as a result. So in this case, it's a little bit less damaging to the brain in the in the, in the cranium of a child versus that of an adult. In an adult, because the cranium is already formed, the sutures have closed, you can't, the, the skull is not going to swell with that increase in pressure, those uh, rises in intracranial pressure are going to be more dramatic in an adult versus a child. 
So um, as far as like management of hydrocephalus, uh, if it's something that isn't, isn't really easily managed or maybe it's from a, um, maybe it's from a, uh, you know, an embryological developmental abnormality, uh, what we would see is they can add a ventriculoperitoneal shunt where it's basically a tube that connects their ventricular system down their neck and into the peritoneal cavity where it can kind of drain that extra excess CSF out of their brain. Um, and there's usually kind of a valve where you can control the flow rate of this um, um, ventricular peritoneal shunt or VP shunt. And this helps to decrease the swelling within their brain. Uh, when this is placed in children, they have to continually lengthen this tube because as the body grows lengthwise, um, this would actually pull out of the peritoneum. So it's just continually lengthened as the child continues to grow. Now, uh, as far as causes of intracranial pressure, we talked about like obstructive hydrocephalus in the case of like neural tube defect or SAH. But there's also non-obstructive hydrocephalus. And that can result from like, you know, excess CSF production. For whatever reason, you know, some individuals might produce more CSF than they can drain adequately. And as a result, CSF ends up, you know, sort of accumulating within the skull. And that would lead to non-obstructive hydrocephalus. There's also one called pseudotumor cerebri, which is basically, um, you know, idiopathic hy uh, hydrocephalus. So they don't really know what causes it, but it's diagnosed through MRI or CT. Um, it may also result from an increase in blood volume. So ways you can get extra blood volume within the cranium would be from like, uh, you know, rises of right atrial pressure. Like we talked about earlier with, uh, you know, congestive heart failure. If you have right-sided heart failure and blood's backing up into the venous system, that will eventually back up into the veins of your brain and that can increase the blood volume of, of the veins in your brain. That can also lead to rises in intracranial pressure. If you get a dural sinus thrombosis or basically a blood clot within the dural venous sinuses, blood's not adequately draining out of the brain and again will back up within the, the skull and lead to rises in intracranial pressure. Um, you can also see this with high arterial CO2 or acidosis because this leads to um, because this leads to vasodilation. Vasodilation, if it's massive, can introduce a lot of blood, extra blood volume into the brain, and as a result, increase you know blood volume and pressure. Um, but what we also see is an increased brain tissue volume, and so uh, ways you could increase the tissue volume of your brain would be from like a tumor, you know, whether it's benign or, or malignant, um, hemorrhages within the brain or around the brain, like within the meninges, like if it's a subdural or subarachnoid hematoma or even epidural hematoma, uh, it could be from infection. So the infection itself can lead to inflammation, which can cause brain tissue to, to swell. But what's also interesting too, is that if it's a bacterial infection, those bacteria can also lead to obstructive hydrocephalus because if those bacteria, like in the case of like bacterial meningitis, if they block those uh, arachnoid granulations, that can also prevent CSF from draining properly. Um, cytotoxic edema is when cells are exposed to some sort of toxin and they, they're unable to maintain adequate fluid gradients, so fluid ends up accumulating within the brain. Uh, vasogenic edema would be like if the blood-brain barrier gets damaged from some sort of toxin or trauma and extra fluid ends up leaking within the brain, that's vasogenic edema, or from like ischemia or necrosis, which would lead to inflammation. So uh, these are just the, some of the different causes of intracranial pressure. Now as far as like the clinical manifestations of ICP, uh, what we would see is things like headache, I mean which seems kind of obvious, but yeah, headache, vomiting, altered levels of consciousness or drowsiness. We see blurry vision from edema of the optic disc, or papal edema. And um, as ICP rises to higher and higher levels, we see decreasing levels of consciousness. Pupillary responsiveness can also um, decrease. We see altered respiratory patterns because the brainstem starts to get impinged. And uh, people become more unresponsive, unable to move, verbalize, or open their eyes. So you see, you know, progressively um, diminishing consciousness and uh, kind of higher and higher numbers on the Glasgow's coma scale, which we'll talk about later. Now, uh, what can happen with ICP is we know the brain gets compressed. 
But since the brain is kind of a soft structure, um, it can compress in ways where the brain can actually herniate. So if you guys remember, a hernia is just a protrusion of tissue into a space where it doesn't normally belong. But since the brain is soft and sort of movable, the brain matter itself can actually herniate into different spaces within the cranium. So as intracranial pressure rises, it can compress on neural, neural tissue and blood vessels, and it can actually herniate or protrude into different areas of the cranium, like in different dural sinuses. So there's types of herniation syndromes, and they're named for where they occur. So if it's subfalcine, tentorial, uncle, or tonsillar, this is just named for the parts of the cranium where the brain is actually herniating into. And so a good picture to sort of demonstrate this process uh, is illustrated here. And so you're looking at a coronal cut of the brain, so sort of frontal view. And you can see subfalcine herniation is when the cortex here herniates um, below the falx cerebri into the corpus callosum. If you guys remember, the corpus callosum earlier is this large white matter tract that connects the two cerebral hemispheres together. And so what you'd see with a false uh, subfalcine herniation is that individuals would have a lot of difficulty with like cognitive functioning. Uh, because they're, the two hemispheres couldn't communicate properly. Uh, if you're talking about like central herniation or tonsillar herniation, uh, what we're seeing here is with central, uh, the diencephalon is sort of herniating down into the brainstem. So because the diencephalon is involved with uh, consciousness, you'd see diminished levels of consciousness. And since the brainstem is involved with vital functioning, you'd see uh, you know uh, respiratory function as well as blood pressure could be affected. Uh, if it's transtentorial, what happens here is that the um, cerebrum is basically herniating across the tentorium cerebelli into the brainstem, and again, affecting respiratory functions. And if it's a tonsillar herniation, it's really just affecting the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is basically herniating through the foramen magnum of the skull down towards the spinal column. And since the cerebellum is involved with balance, um, tonsillar herniations would present as sort of a balance disturbance. So they'd have difficulty walking and moving. Um, but since the brainstem is also nearby, then you, you could see that that herniation would impinge on the brainstem. And they'd also have you know, deficits of uh, ventilation and other vital functions as well. So with management of ICP, um, it could be managed through uh, medical or surgical methods. Uh, typically based on uh, imaging, so CT or MRI, you can get a sense of whether there's some swelling that's occurred or if there's any herniations that have occurred. Um, surgically, uh, you can basically, you know, uh, trephinate the skull and help the help the brain sort of expand into that open space that you've created by removing a piece of uh, skull. Or medically, uh, it can be done by uh, basically introducing hypertonic saline into the bloodstream. So hypertonicity refers to having extra salt. And if you introduce hypertonic saline to the bloodstream, that makes your blood slightly more salty. But since we know that water follows salt, hypertonic saline helps to pull extra fluid out of the cranium and back into your bloodstream. And you see, and this is actually happening, this occurs the first. This is like, you know, you medically treat it first and foremost, and you're going to see uh, dim, you know, diminishing intracranial pressures as a result of hypertonic saline. Now, um, cerebral perfusion pressure is also measured, and uh, if cerebral perfusion pressure is greater than 60, um, that ensures there's adequate blood flow to prevent ischemia, because one of the things that can result is something like a compartment syndrome. If you guys remember, compartment syndrome is sort of swelling within a restrictive space, and if, it, if that swelling leads to pressure that's too high, blood flow can actually stop or slow down into that, that compartment with all the pressure. So in the case of the brain, instead of calling it compartment syndrome, we just call it intracranial pressure. And you want to make sure that your perfusion pressure is high enough to basically, you know, um, cause adequate blood flow to the brain and prevent ischemic damage or injury. Um, you know, if there's some sort of lesion, you can remove that. Or if there's extra CSF, you can drain it. And treatment really focuses on managing cerebral oxygenation. Because if you guys remember going back earlier, we talked about how um, ischemia is the main sort of primary form of injury to the brain, which can lead to a whole host of sequelae, and um, that can actually lead to cell injury and death. So when, when we do treat 
uh, intracranial pressure rises, you know, we basically want to manage cerebral oxygenation and make sure that, that that's high enough to prevent further brain injury. So as far as manifestations of brain injury, um, we can look at level of consciousness or LOC because it's the most sensitive indicator of altered brain function. Um, we define this as like a state of alertness or attentiveness to one's environment. And levels of consciousness can fluctuate, and it's important to monitor this and treat changes if they occur. So when there is a complete loss of consciousness, we call that coma. So uh, there is a scale we can use to sort of quantify the level of consciousness. And it's basically where numeric scores are given to arousal-directed responses to things like eye-opening, verbal utterances, and motor reactions. Uh, it's a scale of basically um, 3 to 15. And uh, we can look at mild responses as, or mild loss of conscious or whatever. It's basically more than 12. Uh, we see it as moderate decreases in levels of consciousness, uh, 9 to 12. And it's considered severe if it's essentially less than 8. Um, now, when we look at the scale, uh, we can see that they're not scaled the same way, even though there are three categories, in that motor responses are the most powerful, powerful predictor of patient outcome. So... When you guys look here, we see we have eye-opening, verbal responses, motor responses. Um, the lowest score for each of these categories is 1. So the lowest score you could ever get on the Glasgow's Coma Scale is a 3. There's no such thing as a 0. Now, um, when you think about like motor responses, um, this is scaled from 1 to 6. 1 meaning none. Like there's basically They're basically completely flaccid. They don't respond to any kind of um, stimulus. And uh, there's no there's no motor movement at all. Now, uh, two would be where we have abnormal extension, which we call decerebration. I'll show you guys a picture of that here pretty soon. Three is abnormal flexion, decortication. Again, that's a that's a specific uh, posture that they take. And we'll, I'll show you guys a picture of that here on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> You give them a score of four if they do have withdrawal. So, for instance, if you do like a sternal chest rub. Uh, and they end up sort of trying to move your hand out of the way, uh, we would consider that withdrawal um, reflex, and they would score four from that. Uh, if they can localize pain, like deliberate or pur purposeful movement to help get rid of pain, then we'd give them a score of five, and they get a score of six if they can obey command. Like if you ask them to raise an arm or you know, blink their eyes or something, um, that would give them a score of six, which is the highest um, for the motor responses. Now, comparing this to something like uh, eye-opening, the highest score you can get is here is a 4, so they're not all scaled to the same maximum number. And um, the highest score for 4 here, we see that uh, patients would spontaneously op um, open their eyes. So, uh, for instance, if they open their eyes and kind of can move their eyes around uh, spontaneously on their own, it seems, uh, then that would give us a score of 4. Now, if they can open their eyes to speech, so for instance, like if they hear people talking, uh, but not necessarily due to a command, like you're not necessarily telling them to open their eyes, but if they hear, if they open their eyes when there's people present and there's sounds going on, or speech rather, then they would that would assign a score of three. If they can only open their eyes to pain, as in a sternal chest rub, then it's a score of two, and it would be a score of one if they never open their eyes. Now, for verbal responses, uh, we would say that um, if you ask them a question and they're oriented to person, place, and time, then that would give them a score of five. Uh, they get a score of four if there's confused speech, like they're disoriented to either um, person, place, or time, like they don't know where they are, who they are, or what day or time it is. Um, inappropriate, swelling, uh, inappropriate swearing or yelling, um, we would give a score of three. And then incomprehensible sounds like moaning, groaning, score of two, or one if there's no verbal response at all. So you can see that the worst Glasgow Coma Scale score you can get is a three, where they don't open their eyes, they, um, they don't have any sort of res verbal responses, or they don't produce any sort of noises, um, and they have no motor sort of tone, so to speak. And the highest score would be 15, where they can open their eyes. They are oriented to person, place, and time when you ask them. And they can, bo they can obey commands to move their body in some way for motor responses. And that would be the highest score, which is 15.
So going back to the motor responses, we said that they're the most powerful predictor of patient outcome. And if you guys remember, the score of two and three were decerebrate and decorticate. So if they ha take on a decorticate posture, that gives them a Glasgow coma scale of score of three. And it's sort of where they um, have abnormal flexion here, where their hands are flexed and their elbows are flexed into a position where it's almost like the fetal position in some sense. We call that decorticate. Uh, decorticate posture implies that their um, brainstem is still intact and functioning properly, but there's a separation of cortical functioning from the rest of the brain. So that's what we call decorticate. And then decerebrate uh, is basically where um, you know the entirety of their cerebrum is no longer sort of in communication with the rest of their body. So what you end up with is abnormal flexion where their arms are completely, ex I'm sorry, abnormal extension, where their arms are completely extended at their sides and uh, wrists are straight. And again, this would be, gives you a Glasgow's coma scale score of two, whereas a one would be no particular posture, like not decorticate or decerebrate, they just are completely flaccid. Now, um, other things you can look for would be various reflex tests. So one way to assess um, sort of the extent of brain injury could be pupillary reflex, which you guys have all practiced and done. Uh, and it's essentially where um, you can shine a light in someone's eyes and look at how quickly their pupils respond to changes in light. And this indicates the function of your brainstem because it involves cranial nerve 2 and cranial nerve 3. So changes in size, shape, and reactivity of the pupil are uh, basically an indi early indicator of rises in intracranial pressure, or possible you know, herniation or other forms of injury. Um, their eye movements are controlled by cranial, cranial nerves 3, four, uh, 4, and 6. And if these are impaired, like if they don't have proper eye movements, like if they can't track um, a pen you know, or have any kind of tracking movement that's coordinated, we, this is, could also imp imply increased intracranial pressure. Or if they have nystagmus or disconjugate movement. So nystagmus would be sort of a, a jutter, uh, fluttering of the eyes, so they don't, they don't move fluidly. And disconjugate would be each individual eye moves independently of each other. So normally the eyes move coordinatedly. You know, like when you track an object, right and left eyes will move side to side and contract that properly. But when there's disconjugate movement, you know, one eye might stay straight while the other eye can move side to side. And that's when they say disconjugate, where they don't move together as they should. Um, ocular palsies would be where there's um, sort of a, an awkward gaze because of abnormal muscle tone in the extraocular muscles of the eye. Again, implying what damage or dysfunction of one of these cranial nerves or the brainstem that it attaches to. Uh, one other reflex test would be the oculovestibular reflex. And the ocular vestibular reflex is basically uh, one where the eyes can move uh, in conjunction with movement of the head. So impaired ocular vestibular reflex tells us that there might be, um, you know, brainstem dysfunction. So two examples of this would be doll's eye maneuver and cold calorics. Doll's eye maneuver is where basically where you rotate the patient's head from side to side. And normally the eyes turn in the opposite direction of your head rotation in order to fix a gaze on an object, right? So if you tell someone to look straight ahead and you move their head to the side, the eyes should move the opposite direction of the head movement to maintain that fixed gaze. Uh, if they don't, and it looks like doll's eyes where the eyes don't move, like you move the head and the, the eyes stay straight or in a certain position where it's like a doll's head, that's why it's called doll's eye maneuver. Um, that, that would suggest an impaired oculovestibular reflex. Uh, cold calorics is where you inject cold, cold saline into someone's ear, and normal response would be a tonic deviation of both eyes towards the side of the ear that's irrigated, and you'd see like a nystagmus uh, in that direction. So like if you had a patient laying on their side and their left ear was exposed, if you were to inject cold saline in, into the left ear, like the external acoustic meatus, um, over some time, there should be a tonic deviation of the eyes towards the left. That's the normal response. If you don't get that response, um, that could, could also suggest impaired brainstem function. Uh, the problem, though, is with both of these tests is that they're not definitive in, the, in and of themselves, and they can have contraindications. So you can't use cold caloric or doll's eye maneuver to like, you know, definitively say whether someone's brainstem is impaired, but uh, at least it gives you a, a fairly 
straightforward idea of whether or not that could be occurring. Um, corneal reflex is also another type of uh, sort of eye test you can do. Uh, but this is looking more at the somatosensory functioning of, of the individual. And so a corneal reflex would be if their eyes are open, if you take a wisp of cotton and if you kind of brush that against the cornea, the normal response is you should elicit a blink reflex. And that would, you know, also indicate normal brainstem functioning. Uh, if they don't blink when you rub a or sort of, um, you know, wisp of cotton across their eye, and just, just ever so gently, uh, that also can suggest their brainstem is not functioning properly, um, and that would imp that would actually be an indicator of pretty severely impaired brainstem uh, because that's actually a, a vital function of the medulla oblongata. So uh, as far as like maintaining adequate brain hemodynamics and metabolism it, uh, with patients that may have rises in intracranial pressure, you'd want to maintain a mean arterial pressure um, or cerebral perfusion pressure above 70 millimeters of mercury. If it gets too low, and with those rises in ICP, uh, they might get inadequate perfusion, and ischemia can result. Um, you can also use hypothermia to reduce brain metabolism. So you guys maybe have seen this before, where you can inject cold, sa cold saline into a patient uh, to temporarily reduce their body temperature, which ultimately reduces their metabolism. And by slowing down their metabolic rate, you decrease the speed at which they use up their resources. So it's sort of like slowing down a car accident. You're not stopping it from happening, but if you slow it down, it basically buys you time to you know, make the appropriate adjustments. Now, um, you could also measure cerebral oxygen ex ex um, extraction as well as oxygen tension just to get a sense of you know, perfusion. And... Um, if increased brain metabolism occurs, um, you know, if, if they're too warm or, you know, if there's too much glutamate being released from injury, that can lead to things like fever, seizure, and um, agitation. And so, uh, you, you know, this should be avoided by, you know, either um, making sure they have good perfusion or uh, with the hypo inducing hypothermia. And moving on to traumatic brain injury or TBI. Uh, we can think about this as being the leading cause of death and disability in the U.S. Um, it's mainly due to uh, head injuries that are caused by transportation-related accidents, like car accidents, or you know, bicycle or motorcycle accidents. Um, you know, taking various falls, accidents involving firearms and sports. So, <clears throat> fortunately, we can we can actually can quantify the severity of TBI by using Glasgow's Coma Scale, like we talked about earlier. So if it's a severe TBI, we would say that it would give a GCS score of 8 or below. If it's a moderate TBI, its GCS score would be between 9 and 12, and then mild TBI would be, you know, GCS of 13 to 15. So with the types of TBI, we could focus on primary injury. Uh, these, these terms kind of describe the site of injury, so focal, polar, diffuse. So when you think about focal, like foci <coughs> or point, if it's a focal injury, we're saying that it's TBI that's localized to one specific brain area. This could be something like, um, you know, you fall and hit your head, but it only causes damage on the site on the side of your head where your head made impact. So it's a focal sort of injury. Um, whereas polar <clears throat> uh, refers to injury that occurs on opposite poles of the brain. So let's say if you took a fall and um, hit your head, but but your head also snapped back um, after the initial fall, uh, where the where you had actually the 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 injury on the the front of your head, because your brain moved back as a result, uh, and it kind of smashed up on along the inside of your skull. Um, on the opposite side, we would call that the polar form of injury, so it occurs on opposite ends, and then diffuse would be like all over. So let's say if you if you tumble and sort of fall continuously, such that uh, there's lots of sites of injury all along the surface of your brain, then we think about that as being diffuse. Um, TBI can also be due to intracranial hematomas. So let's say if someone has head injury and it doesn't necessarily directly cause uh, brain tissue damage, uh, what can occur instead are these intracranial hematomas which are defined based off of uh, basically where the bleed is occurring. So you have epidural, subdural, subarachnoid. 
And if you all remember, these are various spaces that you find um, in and around the meninges. And so they're named for where the blood would sort of spill, uh, not spill, but fill that space. So <clears throat> looking at uh, a cross-section of the skull here, we can see that an epidural hematoma is a space occupying lesion that occurs in the epidural space. And the epidural space is between the dura of your meninges and the skull itself. Uh, because these mostly involve bridging veins, they kind of fill more slowly. And as the blood fills the space, it actually forces the dura away from the skull as this blood sort of begins to occupy that. And as a result, you see a rise in intracranial pressure and then, you know, uh, corresponding deficiencies in, in brain function. Now, <clears throat> over here we see a subdural hematoma where the dura is still attached to the skull but now it's being separated from the arachnoid mater. And so that would be the subdural space. Now it, it's normally present, it's actually a potential space. So it's, it's there, but it, unless it's being filled by something, it's not there, <laughs> hence the name potential space. But a subdural hematoma uh, basically occurs when blood occupies the space between the dura and arachnoid mater. And then uh, what we find down here is a subarachnoid hematoma. Now, subarachnoid hematomas occur in the subarachnoid space, which is basically between the uh, arachnoid and pia mater. And this is the one we talked about earlier as a potential cause of, of hydrocephalus, where if blood begins to fill the subarachnoid space, it can plug those arachnoid granulations, arachnoid villi, and therefore you couldn't reabsorb CSF as easily, so that uh, it, it causes a rise in intracranial pressure. Um, on top of the fact that you're also introducing more fluid, aka blood, um, into this space, which is going to also cause a rise in intracranial pressure. Now, um, with primary injury, we already talked about earlier how it's it's the result of sort of initial trauma on brain cells. Now, <clears throat> um, we said that with TBI, there's three types of primary injury: a focal, polar, and diffuse. Focal, we just say coop um, type of injury. It's localized to one site of impact, so just wherever was you know wherever you had the initial insult, and only that one spot. Polar injuries are coup contra coup, and these are basically due to like acceleration, deceleration, movement of the brain within the skull. So you'd see this with, with a situation where, let's say if someone were in a car and they were rear-ended, and their head snapped forward and back rapidly, well since the brain would uh, move with the skull, it could smash sort of on the inside of the skull, um, both in the front and the back, due to that snapping movement of their head causing this double injury, usually on opposite sides, uh, and that's what we call polar, because on different poles. And then with the diffuse form of injury, we say that um, it's a widespread injury all over the surface of the brain. Uh, you see diffuse injury in cases like shaken baby syndrome, where the head just moves around um, all over the place, um, and it results in widespread axonal injury. Now, <clears throat> with the mechanisms of injury, we have concussions versus contusions. Uh, concussion is more of a mild form of TBI. Uh, there aren't really any dramatic um, changes in the brain tissue. You're not going to see you know, a massive hematoma or a massive bruise in the brain. But there is enough injury to um, lead to various symptoms like headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Fatigue, you know, blurred vision, cognitive and emotional disturbances. So really a wide gambit of uh, deficiencies or symptoms you can see here as a result of concussion. Um, we would see that there could be an alteration or loss of consciousness that must be less than 30 minutes. And there's no evidence of brain damage on CT. And that's, that's how you differentiate concussion versus contusion. Is if they get a head CT and there's no specific evidence of brain damage, like there's no bruise or uh, any other damage, uh, then we would define that as a concussion. That's not to say that damage hasn't occurred, it's just that it's not um, sort of severe enough to be visible on our normal imaging processes. Now with a contusion on the other hand, um, CT or MRI does reveal an injury of brain tissue damage, um, and this could be like a bruise or a laceration, and that could actually lead to necrosis of that of that particular brain area as well. So you can think about a contusion as being a really severe concussion. Um, we would see contusions more associated with the types of primary injury that we talked about earlier, like the focal polar diffuse. Um, these would be examples of 
of sort of the, the contusions that can result from uh, head injury. Um, one thing that can also occur are these intracranial hematomas like we talked about earlier, which is basically like localized collection of blood within the cranium. So these intracranial hematomas result from a disruption of vasculature. And so because of this, you see like micro tears or even large tears in uh, arteries or veins that lead to intracranial hemorrhage. Now, unlike other organs and areas of the body, since your brain is encased within a bony cavity, if you do have a hemorrhage within this cavity, it can lead to pretty dramatic rises in intracranial pressure, um, which can lead to uh, pretty severe deficits. So they may expand slowly or rapidly, and this really depends on the extent of injury and the type of vessel that's being effective, affected. So if it's a vein that's being ruptured, uh, since veins are a lower pressure vessel, uh, we're going to see that blood's going to sort of fill the cranial cavity more slowly, whereas if an artery is being affected, because it's a higher pressure system, uh, blood would fill the, the cranial cavity much more rapidly. And uh, ultimately what this leads to is just progressive compressing of brain structures and the sort of corresponding rises in intracranial pressure that can result. So we'll first talk about the epidural hematoma. Uh, epidural hematoma is basically a collection of blood between the dura and skull. Now, um, since this typically involves arteries, uh, we see that it's a rapid onset of symptoms. And um, the manifestations of this are going to be, uh, you know, it might be, the primary injury could be minor. Like they might just barely bump their head or just have a really minor head injury. Um, and there might be only a brief period of disturbed consciousness. But what, and we call this the lucid interval. But what happens then as a result, because the artery is now ruptured, is that as uh, blood begins to fill this epidural space, uh, consciousness ra rapidly deteriorates. Um, that's what follows the lucid interval. And it's diagnosed through CT. Um, ultimately, this is treated surgically um, to remove the hematoma. And so what they would do is basically just drill a hole in the skull to drain the blood from the site of that hematoma itself. With a subdural hematoma, um, this is a hematoma in the subdural space. Remember, subdural space is located between the dura and outer layer of the arachnoid mater. Uh, since this typically involves bridging veins, the symptoms of onset could be slower. Um, and this might be uh, as little as 24 hours or as many as 10 days later before um, symptoms can occur. So um, it's diagnosed, again, through CT or MRI. Treatment's basically removing the, the uh, hematoma itself. And uh, if there's a chronic subdural hematoma, what we're saying here is that the veins never heal quite right, and so that patients are unfortunately prone to uh, re-bleeding. So their symptoms have to be closely monitored to understand whether bleeding has occurred. So with a subarachnoid hematoma or hemorrhage, or SAH, uh, what we say here is that it's a, a collection of blood that's between the arachnoid membrane and pia mater in that subarachnoid space. And if you guys remember, the subarachnoid space is normally filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And this circulates, um, you know, from the ventricular system and then gets reabsorbed back through the arachnoid villi. Now, again, this also involves bridging veins. Um, so since they are veins, this would be kind of a slower onset of symptoms. Um, this is more commonly associated with a rupture of various aneurysms or AV malformations. Um, they can be arterial in origin as well, and if, if, if it is an arterial origin, like an AV malformation, uh, then those symptoms would actually sort of occur more quickly. Now, what ends up happening with the SAH is that blood spreads throughout the cerebrospinal fluid. This not only causes meningeal irritation, but can also lead to hydrocephalus due to a blockage of those arachnoid granulations. Since blood isn't normally a component of cere cerebrospinal fluid, um, those red blood cells end up plugging the sites of CSF reabsorption, leading to obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, and as a result, you'll see symptoms like headache and then, um, you know, sort of pathophysiology here, like you're going to see ischemia that results from the hydrocephalus and the increase in pressure, and then vasospasms that can also um, lead to headache. Now, with secondary injury, we say that it's your body's response to initial injury. And we talked about earlier how Sometimes the secondary mechanisms of injury are um, uh, sort of your body's normal processes that sort of repair and recuperation from the injury, but that in itself could cause more harm. 
So we talked about the release of things like glutamate, which can cause calcium overload and, and cell death. Uh, we talked about how immune cells can um, invade that site of inflammation and lead to the release of free radicals that can lead to cell death. And ultimately, this leads to ischemia and hypoxic events um, and increases in edema that can lead to even further brain swelling and it increases in intracranial pressure. Uh, we think about secondary injury as a sort of a contaminant uh, trauma that can compl complicate brain injury. And we, we also mentioned how one of the things that uh, are associated with secondary injury are like reperfusion or re um, yeah, reperfusion. So let's say if someone has a temporary loss of blood flow to the brain, uh, reperfusion would be where blood flow is restored but too rapidly. And as a result of that, um, you see the release of free radicals that can accelerate the, the decline in um, brain tissue death. So uh, another example of secondary injury would be like ruptured vessels that can re-bleed or spasm. Um, CSF drainage can become clogged, that, and that can actually increase intracranial pressure as well. So these are all examples of secondary forms of injury. All right, now moving on to cerebrovascular disease and stroke. We're going to first start here with um, stroke, and we can divide this into three main categories. We have transient ischemic attacks, ischemic stroke, and hemorrhagic stroke. And one commonality between all three of these, even though they're caused by different things, is that they all lead to deficits of cerebral perfusion. Uh, and because of this deficit of cerebral perfusion, we see a sudden onset of neurological dysfunction. So whatever part of the brain is not receiving adequate blood flow, uh, that's basically going to lead to the, you know, the, the symptoms due to the deficit of that particular brain's function. So um, as far as epidemiology goes, we know that stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, but the most co common form of stroke is ischemic stroke. Um, females more affected than males, uh, and this is due to reproductive hormones. When you think about like progesterone and estrogen are pro-clotting hormones. This is one of the reasons why females have a higher risk factor for stroke than males. Um, risk factors for stroke are similar to other um, sort of vascular diseases, you know, ones that can contribute to atherosclerosis. So when you think about um, the modifiable risk factors for uh, vascular diseases like hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, or the unmodifiable risk factors like diabetes, advancing age, family history, um, and maybe even depression. So uh, yeah, these things are sort of the risk factors for stroke. Now, we're going to first start here with ischemic stroke. Uh, ischemic stroke results from a sudden occlusion of cerebral artery, usually from a thrombus or an embolus. So thrombotic strokes are associated with atherosclerosis. So what happens is if someone has a you know, hardening of their arteries such that the blood vessel eventually tears, uh, that ruptured vessel ends up forming a clot. And if that clot doesn't move, then that's what we call a thrombus. So that can lead to a thromb thrombotic stroke if the, th if the thrombus completely occludes the artery. Um, also other coagulopathies. So if, if people are more prone to coagulation uh, and those um, clots basically block the vessel, um, that can also lead to ischemic stroke. Um, embolic strokes are more associated with cardiac dysfunction and dysrhythmias. So if you guys remember part of Virchow's triad about blood clotting um, predicted that uh, if you have abnormal blood flow, like turbulent blood flow, as you'd see with like AFib, well, uh, AFib, because it causes blood to move in a non-laminar fashion, that can actually cause little clots to form. And uh, if those form in the left atrium, then that can get basically pushed into the left ventricle, out to the aorta, and potentially even reach the brain from there. Um, and that can lead to an ischemic stroke. Now, uh, as far as clinical manifestations of ischemic stroke, we will see things like contralateral hemiplegia. So hemiplegia refers to just sort of a um, semi-paralysis on one side. And um, contralateral means opposite. So let's say if someone has a um, ischemic stroke in the right motor cortex, what you'll see then is left hemiplegia because the right motor cortex, due to decussation of those axons in the brainstem, they cross to the opposite side of the body, so the right motor cortex actually controls muscles on the left side of your body, and vice versa. Um, you also see hemisensory loss and potentially even contralateral visual field blindness. Now, 
with treatment of ischemic stroke, uh, basically it's, it's aimed at salvaging the penumbra. So the penumbra is the area of tissue that surrounds that blood vessel. And so um, since this is uh, going to be at a higher risk for um, cell death due to a lack of blood flow, uh, basically what this is going to be aimed, the treatments are going to be aimed at salvaging that penumbra, penumbra through thrombotic therapies. And um, this needs to be done within three hours of symptom onset to be maximally effective. So when you hear about like your stroke units, um, really time is of the essence uh, to treat that stroke as soon as possible, as soon as these um, sort of uh, symptoms present. Now, if neurological deficits are completely resolved, uh, then we think about this as being a transient ischemic attack. So let's say if someone temporarily experiences um, hemisensory loss or um, hemiplegia, um, but that only lasts minutes, then what we think about that as being is it was not uh, an ischemic stroke or an embolic stroke. Uh, what we can think about that as being is a, a transient ischemic attack. So these TIAs are can be warning signs of thrombotic disease, and they do carry a significant risk factor. But TIAs we can think about as being more like um, you know like vasospasms, uh, where the blood vessels start to uh, increase and decrease in diameter rapidly. And due to that abnormal fluctuation in blood flow, you do see uh, deficits in brain function as a result. Um, these ischemic strokes can be treated with things like aspirin, um, which is an anticoagulant. Uh, you can do carotid endarterectomy, which is basically removing um, any kind of atherosclerotic plaque that may be in the carotid artery, or possibly even angioplasty, which is basically just you know opening up that blood vessel with a stent if it's more than 70% occluded. Now, um, in contrast, we have hemorrhagic stroke. Um, hemorrhagic stroke would be the, where an artery or vein uh, ruptures within the brain, and that leads to a hemorrhage. Um, that hemorrhage within the brain parenchyma, or brain tissue, um, basically leads to uh, decline in uh, tissue oxygenation and possibly even uh, tissue death. So. It usually occurs secondary to some other severe disease like chronic hypertension uh, or carotid atherosclerosis. Uh, and what we find is that these most often occur in the basal ganglia or the thalamus. And the reason being is that the blood vessels that supply the basal ganglia and thalamus are closest to the circle of Willis, which is the blood vessel that supplies the brain. And that circle of Willis is a higher pressure system, which explains why these are more likely to rupture in the case of a hemorrhagic stroke. Now, um, the degree of secondary injury is associated with morbidity and mortality that is much higher um, in hemorrhagic stroke than ischemic stroke. Um, so the hemorrhagic stroke leads to more severe secondary symptoms than ischemic stroke, um, mainly because that leakage of blood into the brain tissue causes pretty massive inflammation. Um, you're gonna get activation of local immune cells, that really um, accelerate this uh, increase in brain injury. Now, uh, with treatment of hemorrhagic stroke, we'll see that we're going to—it's going to be aimed at cardiovascular stabilization. Um, brain CT would help determine the type and location, and we can monitor intracranial pressure for management. Um, if it's ischemic stroke, basically the treatment's aimed at uh, minimizing the size of the infarct and preserving neurological function. This is achieved with things like thrombolytics, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, um, endarterectomy, which is basically a surgery to remove the atherosclerotic plaque, uh, angioplasty and stents to um, basically open up that blood vessel and increase blood flow. Um, if it's hemorrhagic stroke, the treatment's really aimed at maintaining adequate blood pressure. And so what's interesting here is, and it might be a little bit counterintuitive, is that if someone has a hemorrhagic stroke and their blood vessels sort of ruptured and hemorrhaging and bleeding into the brain, um, early on the treatment is actually keeping those patients mildly hypertensive. And the goal here is to is that by keeping them mildly hypertensive, you can increase the amount of perfusion pressure and and help accommodate for any uh, loss in pressure due to that hemorrhage. That way, you can basically continue to supply the that local area of brain tissue or the penumbra um, with an inadequate amount of oxygen uh, to keep it alive. Now, in terms of sequelae of uh, stroke, 
we'll find is uh, there are motor and sensory deficits that can result. Um, initially, motor deficits will be like flaccidity or paralysis, so pretty low on the Glasgow's coma scale. Um, recovery from a motor function uh, will usually begin with an onset of spasticity. So let's say if a patient is initially flaccid <coughs> or paralyzed, um, when there is recovery, they're going to have a little bit of spasticity. So there'll be you know twitching and that sort of thing. Uh, sensory disturbances can occur in the same locations as motor paralysis and uh, may involve visual neglect or visual impairment. So visual neglect would mean they uh, don't really uh, have attention to what they're seeing. Uh, even though they can see, they're not, they're, their attentional processes to that thing are um, impaired. Uh, visual impairment would just be they just can't see out of a particular um, <clears throat> sensory field um, in and of itself. Now, language deficits that could occur would be aphasia. So we talked about aphasias earlier uh, with respect to the specific brain regions like Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. If you guys remember, Broca's aphasia um, is due to a decrease in function of Broca's area, which is within the, the left frontal lobe in most people. And um, what this leads to is verbal motor expressive deficits. So they have really poor articulation, and extremely sparse vocabulary as a result. Um, and if you can kind of monitor those symptoms, that can get, I'll give you a sense of where in the brain the stroke is affected. Now, uh, with Wernicke's aphasia, <clears throat> we talked about how the Wernicke's area was located um, between the left parietal lobe and left temporal lobe. And since Wernicke's area is located in speech recognition, uh, what we'll see is impaired auditory comprehension. Um, and so they will be able to produce speech, but they won't be able to understand speech. Um, and interestingly enough, too, is that even though they can, um, even though the Broca's area may be uh, intact with Wernicke's aphasia, um, since you do require a little bit of feedback as far as like hearing your own voice while you talk, if people have Wernicke's aphasia, they end up uh, having speech disturbance as well because uh, they they have difficulty understanding the words that they're producing. And for that reason, uh, their brain ends up getting confused. And the speech that they produce is fluent, but it doesn't make sense. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of sound like blather, if that makes sense. Now, some of the cognitive deficits we can see with stroke would be, um, you know, an area of brain that uh, um, dictates presence or severity of cognitive impairments. And so whatever brain area is affected by that stroke, you'll see the corresponding cognitive deficits. Um, and so this could be evidence as language impairment, uh, impairment of spatial relationship skills, short-term memory, and poor judgment. Um, just depends on where the stroke is affected. And um, you'll see concentration, memory, and reasoning may also be re repaired. And over time may require uh, rehabilitative services. So, um, you know, there's cases where people end up with Broca's aphasia that's more uh, chronic, long-lasting, and they under have to go through uh, speech therapy to basically relearn how to speak. Um, so, fortunately, the brain has a lot of plasticity, so it's able to sort of accommodate for damage. Um, it'll never be the, quite the same, but, you know, these people can uh, re recover and recuperate some of that functioning um, through, you know, long-term rehabilitation. Now, moving on to uh, aneurysms, uh, we know that aneurysms are basically an, a dilation or ballooning of a segment of a vessel, um, and this can rupture. So, uh, we think about like cerebral aneurysms, as far as their epidemiology, 60% um, of those af affected with a cerebral aneurysm will die or suffer from permanent disability. Um, as far as the risk factors for aneurysm, it's due to high blood pressure, alcohol intoxication, and recreational drug use, including cocaine. Um, and the, the link here between cocaine and aneurysm is, um, you know, cocaine as a stimulant uh, causes pretty severe hypertension, and that hypertension can um, impair the integrity of the vessel wall uh, and lead to the formation of aneurysms, including those of the cerebral arteries. Uh, sometimes cerebral aneurysms could be congenital. So it could be a congenital defect, um, you know, in the medial layer of the artery, uh, which we call the, the tunica media, which is the smooth muscle layer. And uh, it allows a dilated portion of, to, of that artery to fill with blood and eventually burst, causing hemorrhage. 
uh, most of the most often these cerebral aneurysms are located in the circle of Willis. You guys remember the circle of Willis is a circular network of blood vessels that's located just on the the basal surface of the brain. Um, it's fed by the vertebral arteries and the internal carotid arteries. And because those are the higher pressure arteries that serve the brain, um, circular willis is also a higher pressure system, which means it's more likely to undergo, um, you know, the the structural changes that accompany uh, aneurysm. So, as far as like clinical manifestations of cerebral aneurysms go, um, what this will present with is things like photophobia or visual sensitivity. Um, and again, this is because of the the proximity to the circular willis. So since the circle of Willis is located right by your optic nerves, you'll, you'll often see that there's some visual impairment. Uh, nausea, vomiting, stiff neck, again, from intracranial pressure. Uh, diagnosis, you know, CT, MRI. Um, lumbar puncture would, would give you information about whether an aneurysm is ruptured or not. Um, lumbar puncture won't tell you if an aneurysm is present. It'll only tell you if, if bleeding is occurring within the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, uh, treatment of cerebral aneurysms would be like surgical stabilization. Uh, you can either clip or embolize that an aneurysm. And if there's vasospasms, uh, basically um, those are managed with calcium channel blockers to prevent you know, TIAs. And um, one thing that's similarly related to an aneurysm, but uh, sl slightly different, is uh, arteriovenous malformation or AV malformation. Um, these are a congenital defect that, that occur where arteries abnormally attach to veins. So if you guys remember going back to your, um, you know, your cardiovascular anatomy, normally arteries branch into smaller and smaller vessels, which then lead into capillary beds with very low pressure. And then those drain into veins and then that goes back to the heart. Now, in the case of an AV malformation, the capillary system fails to develop, and instead what you have is an artery directly connecting to a vein. Now the reason why this is bad is that veins have uh, thinner walls, and they're not you know, really set up to have like a high pressure system. So if you have a high pressure vessel like an artery going right into a lower pressure vessel like a vein, well that's going to put a lot of stress on that vein, and it's going to create something that's like an aneurysm. Uh, we don't call it that. It's we call it AV malformation because it's due to the uh, abnormal sort of anatomy of an artery attaching directly to a vein. Now, as far as clinical manifestations here, uh, we'll see things like seizure, just various neurological dysfunction, depending on where this AV malformation may be located. Um, it's diagnosed through, again, CT or MRI. And it's treated through surgical removal, um, which could be stereotactic radiosurgery. You know, so it's a little bit more less invasive, uh, or even glue embolization. So glue embolization is an interesting procedure, where they'll eventually go up through the vessel and apply a glue that plugs that vessel and effectively um, removes the link uh, and blood flow there. And the point is, you're just sort of um, encouraging that AV malformation to uh, disappear. So uh, what this slide shows is pre and post embolization. And so uh, what you guys can see here is the uh, internal carotid artery. And it's eventually going up and going into the circle of Willis. And you can see all the uh, rest of the cerebral arteries branching off that circle of Willis. Now, uh, this is the, the example of the um, AV malformation. And you can tell because there's this ballooning here. Like this isn't normal vessel anatomy. Uh, this is. So normally blood vessels should be sort of straight and tubular. <laughs> But uh, what you guys can see here is this sort of abnormal ballooning. That's the AV malformation, and it's it's like an embolism. I'm sorry, it's like an aneurysm <clears throat> in the sense that it's a ballooning and it actually could tear and lead to um, disability and death. So uh, what surgeons can do is basically go up through these blood vessels, follow this pathway to the AV malformation, uh, apply a glue just before the uh, AV malformation um, just preceding the AV malformation. And by doing that, you can cut off blood flow to that malformation and uh, encourage that, that tissue to sort of disappear, if that makes sense. Now, I'm um, kind of wrapping up here the lecture with CNS infections. Um, organisms can gain access to the CNS or central nervous system through your bloodstream, 
or um, as a direct extension of a primary site through cranial nerves or even um, maternal fecal exchange. Now, some of the risk factors for CNS infection would be if you're immunocompromised or debilitated, have poor nutrition, if you've undergone recent radiation, steroid therapy, or, or contact with specific vectors. Uh, when you think about like meningitis or cerebral abscess, um, this is mostly associated with bacterial infections, um, but if patients are suffering from encephalitis, which is just basically swelling of the brain tissue itself, that's usually viral. So with meningitis, we'll start here talking about bacterial infection. So bacteria can reach the CNS through the bloodstream or extension through different cranial nerves like sinuses or ears. So an example of uh, bacterial meningitis would be um, it's kind of common is where individuals who have a, a middle ear infection, if that spreads to the mastoid sinus of their temporal bone, uh, it actually can gain access into the cranial cavity through those mastoid air cells, and um, that can lead to meningitis. So think about like middle ear infections are treated very seriously because if, if untreated, they can progress to meningitis over time. Now, uh, the more common bacteria that causes meningitis is strep pneumonia, and um, <clears throat> these bacteria invade the meninges and they accumulate um, as an inflammatory exudate. And uh, this inflammatory exudate and the bacteria themselves can block uh, the um, arachnoid granulations, arachnoid villi, and that in itself can lead to obstruct obstructive hydrocephalus and uh, rises in intracranial pressure. Now, classic presentation of meningitis would be headache, fever, stiff neck, which we call meningismus. And um, other signs of cerebral dysfunction could be things like confusion, delirium. Uh, and it's diagnosed fairly straightforwardly through lumbar puncture. Um, when, the, when, you, when the physician performs lumbar puncture, they're going to pull out samples of CSF. And normally CSF is going to have kind of like a plasma-like appearance. It's going to be uh, clear and slightly yellow. Um, <clears throat> now, if meningitis is, is occurring or if it's present, there is an infection present, um, that CSF could be cloudy and sort of hazy. Um, and that would be a little bit more indicative of, uh, of meningitis. Um, obviously, that would go to a lab, and they can get a more definitive diagnosis through lab culture. Now, uh, meningitis is treated through IV antibiotic therapy and supportive measures, as well as corticosteroids. Now, the corticosteroids are controversial because they act to decrease inflammation, but if you guys remember back in your anatomy classes, we, we, or physiology as well, we discussed how corticosteroids are also immunosuppressants. So it's sort of a double-edged sword, is you can use a corticosteroid to decrease inflammation, but it also suppresses your immune response, and that can lead to um, you know, an acceleration of, of that infection. Now, um, meningitis can be prevented with vaccination, um, so if you hear about like the, you know, the meningitis vaccine, like HIV and um, Neisseria meningitis vaccination as well. Now, uh, encephalitis is uh, similar to meningitis, but we're talking about inflammation of the brain itself here. Now, generally, encephalitis is going to be caused by viruses. And the reason being is that viruses can spread throughout the brain tissue much more readily than bacteria can. Um, Brain tissue is kind of dense, it has lots of cells, and as a result, uh, viruses are a little better suited to spreading through brain tissue because they can just jump from cell to cell, they're smaller. And so um, some of the common viruses that can lead to encephalitis would be things like West Nile, um, there's Western equine encephalitis, and herpes simplex, like HSV1, HSV2, um, also seem to play a role in it, encephalitis. Uh, it can be diagnosed through CT, MRI, you know, that'll give you a sense of if there's any kind of structural changes or swelling that's occurred, as well as lumbar puncture, uh, because you can do PCR and the lumbar puncture to look for basically viral DNA or RNA. Now, encephalitis is basically treated with supportive, um, you know, supportive therapy, control symptoms. You can use antipyretics to decrease fever, antivirals, steroids, um, anti-seizures to prevent, you know, sort of seizure complications, and just general fluid resuscitation as well. Now, um, abscesses 
um, can occur in the brain as well. You guys are all familiar with abscesses elsewhere in the body, but <clears throat> in the brain, you know, like the rest of the body, they're basically just localized collections of pus within the brain parenchyma or tissue. Uh, these pus-forming bacteria or pyogenic bacteria are the ones that cause these abscesses, and they, they actually present as space-occupying lesions. So again, brain abscesses can also lead to intracranial pressure arises, um, and this is a, an infectious etiology. So these abscesses can be treated with surgical drainage and excision of the abscess, as well as uh, you know corresponding IV antibiotics. So I just wanted to thank you guys for you know listening for this this lecture. I hope you guys learned some new things, and uh, I will drop my email down in the in the description here. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out, email me. And um, again, I uh, hope you guys have a good day, and thank you for, for following along.